We've considered two talks so far in our coverage of the October 2023 annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. Until now, neither talk has contained information that you might call life-threatening. That's about to change. The next symposium talk delivered by Jeffrey Jackson of Australia Royal Commission fame could very well endanger the life of anyone who believes what he says and acts on it out of a misguided sense of loyalty. This wouldn't be the first time that people's lives have been put in jeopardy for following the governing body's interpretation of scripture. But we're not talking about medical decisions such as whether to accept a blood transfusion or an organ transplant. We're talking about a life-threatening situation that will, at some point in time, affect every Jehovah's Witness on the planet who remains loyal to the teachings of the governing body. Before you can get to that, Jeffrey has first to lay the foundation for the so-called new light he's going to present. He does this by giving his audience a thumbnail sketch of the last day's theology of Jehovah's Witnesses. He doesn't attempt to prove any of these beliefs, which he at some point calls facts. He doesn't need to prove anything because he knows he's preaching to the choir and they'll simply accept everything he has to say. But what he's about to reveal in this talk is something I never thought I'd see. So let's follow along as he presents his review. Over the last few years, we've had a few changes with regard to the events that occurred during the Great Tribulation. And if you've been in the truth for a while, sometimes it's a bit hard to remember, was that what we used to believe or is this what we believe now? So to help us to make sure that we've got some idea of some of the events that occur during the Great Tribulation, let's look at this review. Jeffrey is joking about all the changes they've made over the past years and decades, and his compliant audience is laughing along as if this is no big thing. His flippancy demonstrates a colossal insensitivity to the enormous suffering that the governing body has caused its flock by its constant misinterpretations of Scripture. These are not trivial matters. These are matters of life and death. His audience is eager to eat up anything he feeds to them. They will believe and act on his instructions about what they must do when the end of this system of things comes. If the governing body is providing faulty instructions on what to do to be saved, they will bear an enormous burden of blood guilt. What does the Bible say? It sounds an indistinct call who will get ready for battle. 1 Corinthians 14.8 Jeffrey is sounding a warning trumpet, but if it's not sounding a truthful call, his listeners will not be ready for the battle that is to come. He begins by referring to events that he says will occur during the Great Tribulation. What does he mean by the Great Tribulation? He's referencing Revelation 7.14, which reads in part, These, an unnumberable great crowd, are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7.14. Witnesses have been led to believe that only they understand the scripture. However, it would surely surprise them to learn that pretty much every church in Christendom believes in the Great Tribulation, and they all link it to their own particular version of Armageddon and the end of the world. Why do all the religions of Christendom believe that the Great Tribulation is some cataclysmic event? the end of all things? What does it say about the governing body that they have joined with other religions in a wrong interpretation of what the Great Tribulation means? What do they have in common with other religions? To answer that, do you not recall how often Jesus warns us about false prophets? And what is the stock and trade of a false prophet? Essentially, what is he selling? Love? Hardly. Truth? Please. No, it is fear. He depends on fear, specifically in instilling fear in his flock. That makes them subservient to the false prophet as the provider of escape from the thing they fear. Deuteronomy 18.22 tells us that a false prophet speaks presumptuously and that we should not fear him. 
By the way, I used to believe that the Great Tribulation of Revelation chapter 7 refers to an end of the world period of time. Then I discovered the method of Bible study known as exegesis, and when I applied that to what Revelation chapter 7 talks about, I found something very different and encouraging to us as the children of God who put faith in Jesus. However, I won't get into that here as it would take us off the matter at hand. If you're interested in what I found the Great Tribulation and the Great Crowd to really refer to, I'll put some links in the description of this video to articles and videos on the subject. Of course, you could also get a detailed account from my book, Shutting the Door to the Kingdom of God, How Watchtower Stole Salvation from Jehovah's Witnesses, which is available on Amazon. But for now, we'll just listen to what Jeffrey wants us to believe is true, because we want to get to the meat of his talk. So to help us to make sure that we've got some idea of some of the events that occur during the Great Tribulation, let's look at this review. What event starts the Great Tribulation? The destruction of Babylon the Great. That will be the time when the political powers turn on the world empire of false religion, showing their disgust for this symbolic prostitute. This will lead to the destruction of all false religious organizations. So, the first thing witnesses are expecting to happen is the attack upon Babylon the Great by its political lovers, the world leaders who have been in bed with false religion. Jeffrey says that all false religions will be destroyed. But have we, haven't we seen in video after video how all the doctrines that are unique to Jehovah's Witnesses have proven to be false? So, using the measure, measure by which they judge other religions, how can we exclude JW.org from being part of Babylon the Great? Since JW.org qualifies as part of false religion, true Christians are told that they must do something. And I heard another voice out of heaven say, Get out of her, my people, if you do not want to share with her her sins, and if you do not want to receive part of her plagues, Revelation 18.4. But the Watchtower organization tells Jehovah's Witnesses that they've already done that. They got out of her, out of false religion, when they became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But did they? How can you trust anything they say when they keep changing the rules? They seem to be growing more and more inept. As, as time goes by. They can't even keep their own current doctrines straight. For instance, the graphic they use says that the Great Tribulation starts with the fall of Babylon the Great. But according to Watchtower Theology, that already happened in 1919. Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion, is mentioned first. Another, a second angel followed saying, she has fallen. Babylon the Great has fallen. Revelation 14.8. Yes, from God's standpoint, Babylon the Great has already fallen. In 1919, Jehovah's anointed servants were set free from the bondage of Babylonish doctrines and practices which have dominated peoples and nations for millenniums. Watchtower from 2005, October 1st, page 24, paragraph 16. Keep on the watch, the hour of judgment has arrived. I ask you now, how can you put your life in the hands of men who continually bumble along, constantly changing their teachings about the way to salvation? I mean, they can't even get their current teachings straight. Jeffrey continues with his review. What event ends the Great Tribulation? The Battle of Armageddon. That will be the final part of the Great Tribulation. Jesus, along with the resurrected 144,000 and myriads of angels, will battle with all those who oppose Jehovah, His kingdom, and His people here on earth. This will be the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Armageddon is only mentioned once in the Bible at Revelation 16.16. 16. It is called the war of the great day of God the Almighty. But in this war, who is God warring against? Everyone on earth? That has been the position of Jehovah's Witnesses since before I was born. 
I was taught that everyone on earth, except for Jehovah's Witnesses, would die forever at Armageddon. That belief was based on the assumption that it would be like the flood of Noah's day. Now, imagine teaching something like that for decades, claiming you are receiving light from God through Holy Spirit, that you are his channel for feeding the flock, and then suddenly, one day, making this astonishing admission. Now let's talk about the flood of Noah's day. In the past, we've said that any who died in the flood would not be resurrected. But does the Bible say that? What? We said this? We taught this? We demanded that you believe this and teach it to your Bible students, but we didn't really check to see if the Bible actually says this thing we're feeding to you? This is what they've called food at the proper time. Yeah. That's what it is. You know, you might even be able to forgive them if they were willing to ask for forgiveness, but they aren't. We are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Apparently, they feel none of this is their fault. They are unwilling to take any responsibility for any harm done. Since they feel they've done no wrong, they have no need to repent. Instead, they choose to counsel everyone else, not to be dogmatic, but to go with what the Bible says. Too bad it took them so long to do that, because reading what the Bible says about Noah's flood should have informed them long ago that they were wrong about Armageddon. Jehovah made a covenant with Noah, and through him, with all of us. That covenant was a promise to never again destroy all flesh. Yes, I establish my covenant with you, Never again will all flesh be destroyed by the waters of a flood, and never again will a flood bring the earth to ruin. Genesis 9:11. Now, it would be pretty silly if what God meant was, I promise not to destroy all flesh by a flood, but I reserve the right to use any other means to do so. That wouldn't be much of an assurance, would it? But is that just me speculating and posing my personal interpretation on Scripture like the governing body has done throughout my lifetime and before? No, because there's this little thing called exegesis, which the so-called channel of communication between God and men has neglected to use. With exegesis, you let the Bible define what it means. In this case, what is meant by the word flood as a method of destruction? In predicting the utter devastation upon Jerusalem, which occurred in the first century, Daniel writes, And the people of a leader who is coming will destroy the city and the holy place, and its end will be by the flood, and until the end there will be war. What is decided upon is desolations. Daniel 9.26 There was no literal flood of water in 70 CE when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem, but as Jesus predicted, not a stone was left upon a stone, just as if a literal flood of water had swept through the city. Given God's use of the word flood in Genesis and again in Daniel, we can see that he was telling us that he would never again destroy all life on earth, all flesh, as he did in Noah's day. Could the reason that the governing body didn't realize that simple truth be because they had an agenda? Remember, a false prophet needs to keep you in fear. The belief that everyone outside of the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses would perish at Armageddon would keep everyone inside the organization loyal to their leadership. On a side note, does it not irritate you to see that they paint all angels with wings? True, seraphs are depicted in the Bible with six wings, two to fly with, two to cover their face, and two to cover their feet. But that is so obviously a metaphor, a symbolic vision. And Jesus is not shown in Revelation, coming with a bow and an arrow and a superhero cape flying behind him. To the contrary, and I'm quoting from the New World Translation, I saw heaven opened and look, a white horse, and the one seated on it is called Faithful and True, and he judges and carries on war in righteousness. His eyes are a fiery flame, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but he himself, and he is clothed with an outer garment stained with blood, and out of his mouth protrudes a sharp long sword with which to strike the nations, and he will shepherd them with a rod 
of iron, Revelation 19, 11 to 15. So you guys in the art department, read your Bible before you pick up your paintbrush. Where's the outer garment stained with blood? Where's the sharp long sword? Where's the rod of iron? What is amazing is that for a religion that criticizes other churches for their Babylonish depictions, there sure are a lot of influences from pagan religions showing up in Watchtower artwork. Maybe they should put a poster up in their art department that reads, Does the Bible say that? Of course, they are not really that concerned about what the Bible actually says. What is their concern is that their flock live in fear. That is evident from what is next introduced by Jeffrey Jackson into his last day's timeline. Now that we have the start and the end of the Great Tribulation in mind, let's ask a few more questions. How long will that time period be from start to finish? The answer is, we don't know. We do know that many events are foretold to happen during that time period. But these events may all occur in a reasonably short period of time. For this discussion, though, let's focus on the few events that will occur toward the end of the Great Tribulation. When does the attack of Gog of Magog occur? It doesn't occur at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, but toward the end of that period of time. This attack on God's people by a coalition of nations will lead right into the Battle of Armageddon. So Gog's attack will occur just prior to Armageddon. Outside of wish fulfillment and the need of a false prophet to traffic in fear, I can see no reason for the belief that Ezekiel's prophecy about Gog and Magog can be made to apply to an attack on Jehovah's Witnesses before Armageddon. For one thing, they won't be around by then having been taken out by the kings of the earth in the attack on Babylon the Great. For another, Gog and Magog are only mentioned in one other place outside of Ezekiel. Here, look with me. Ezekiel prophesies about Gog of the land of Magog. He says that God will send fire upon Magog and upon those who are inhabiting the islands in security, and people will have to know that I am Jehovah. Ezekiel 39, 6. Now, to the only other place in Scripture where Gog and Magog are mentioned. Now, as soon as a thousand years have been ended, Satan will be let loose out of his prison, and he will go out to mislead those nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of these is as the sand of the sea, and they advanced over the breadth of the earth and encircled the camp of the holy ones and the beloved city, but fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 27 to 9. So Ezekiel says that fire from God will destroy Gog and Magog, and John says the same thing in Revelation. But John's vision fixes the time of that destruction, not at Armageddon, but after the thousand-year reign of Christ is over. How can we read that in any other way? However, the governing body needs some Bible account to scare witnesses into believing there will be a final attack upon the other sheep who are left behind when the anointed go to heaven. So, they cherry-pick Ezekiel's prophecy to fit their agenda. To support one false doctrine, the other sheep as a separate class of Christian, they have to continue coming up with more false doctrines. One lie built on another and then on another. And, well, you get the picture. But again, the question we should ask ourselves is, But does the Bible say that? Now, Jeffrey moves to fix the timing of when the anointed who are alive during the governing body's idea of the Great Tribulation will be taken to heaven. He is not talking about the resurrection of the anointed, the first resurrection, because, according to the governing body, that has already occurred over 100 years ago, back in 1918, and has been going on ever since. When will the remaining ones of the anointed be gathered and taken to heaven? The Bible book of Ezekiel indicates that when Gog of Magog starts his attack, some of the anointed will still be here on earth. However, Revelation 17:14 tells us that when Jesus battles with the nations, 
he will come with those who are called and chosen, that is, all of the resurrected 144,000. So the final gathering of his chosen ones must occur after the start of the attack of Gog of Magog and before the Battle of Armageddon. This means that the anointed will be gathered and taken to heaven toward the end of the Great Tribulation, not at the beginning. Why has there been so much confusion among Jehovah's Witnesses about when the anointed will be resurrected? The Bible clearly tells us. For this is what we tell you by Jehovah's word, that we the living who survive to the presence of the Lord shall in no way precede those who have fallen asleep in death, because the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a commanding call, with an archangel's voice, and with God's trumpet, and those who are dead in union with Christ will rise first. Afterward, we the living who are surviving will, together with them, be caught away in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17 Oh, I get it. Witnesses have been sold a bill of goods, claiming that Jesus' presence started in 1914. There's a little problem with that, isn't there? You see, all the dead anointed ones will be resurrected at his presence, according to what the Bible says. But it also says that at his presence, the anointed who survive to his presence will be changed, transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Paul tells us all this when he writes to the congregation in Corinth. Look, I tell you a sacred secret. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, during the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised up incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-52. So this trumpet, which is referred to in both Corinthians and Thessalonians, sounds at the coming or presence of Jesus. If that happened in 1914, why is Jeffrey and the rest of the governing body still with us? Either they are not anointed, or they are anointed and they're wrong about a 1914 presence of Jesus. Or there's a third option to consider. They are not anointed, and on top of that, the presence of Christ hasn't come yet. I'm kind of leaning toward that latter, because if Christ were present in 1914, then we would have heard news reports of thousands of faithful Christians suddenly disappearing from the earth. And since that didn't happen, and since the governing body is still claiming that Christ's presence began in 1914, they're promoting a falsehood, which sort of kind of goes against their being anointed with Holy Spirit, don't you think? Since almost all Jehovah's Witnesses are made up of non-anointed, so-called other sheep, the governing body has to find a way to fit them into the picture. Enter Jesus' parable of the sheep and goats, suddenly recrafted into an end times prophecy of final judgment. When will the final judgment of the sheep and the goats take place? Again, although we can't be dogmatic as to the exact sequence of events, it appears that the final judgment takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation, not at the beginning. That will be the time when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him. Of course, there are a lot of other events that are foretold to happen during this time period. But for now, let's just focus on these few events all of which will happen just before the outbreak of Armageddon. What do we learn from them? First, Jesus' judgment of the sheep and the goats and the destruction of the wicked will take place at the end of the Great Tribulation. Second, there will be some of the remaining ones of the anointed on earth until the start of the attack of Gog of Magog, right at the end of the Great Tribulation. Third, the judgment of the sheep and the goats will include their dealings with Christ's brothers even during the Great Tribulation. There is a glaring problem with the way the governing body applies the parable of the sheep and goats. They believe that the sheep are other sheep who are not anointed and who do not inherit everlasting life. The reason they do not get everlasting life, whether they survive Armageddon or are resurrected 
in the New World is that they are still sinners. They don't reach perfection until the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Here is their official position. Unhindered in their spiritual progress by Satan and his demons, I repeat, unhindered by Satan and his demons, these Armageddon survivors will gradually be helped to overcome their sinful tendencies until finally they reach perfection. Watch chart from 1999, November 1st, page 7. Prepare for the millennium that matters. So, J.W. other sheep, whether they survive Armageddon or die and are resurrected, both will gradually, gradually overcome sinful tendencies and reach perfection and so attain to everlasting life by the end of the millennium that matters. So how is it that the anointed Jehovah's Witnesses somehow are not hindered in their spiritual progress by Satan and his demons as the other sheep are? I guess they're just extra special humans. That is the reward handed out to the other sheep according to Jeffrey Jackson and the rest of the governing body. But does the Bible say that? No, it does not say that. And it is telling that while Jeffrey informs us that the goats go off into everlasting destruction, he makes no mention of the reward Jesus promises to the sheep-like ones. Why hide that fact from us, Jeffrey? This is what the Bible says. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who have been blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. Matthew 25, 34. These goats will depart into everlasting cutting off, but the righteous ones, sheep, into everlasting life. Matthew 25, 46. Jesus is talking about the inheritance prepared for his anointed brothers, the sheep in the parable, prepared for them since the founding of the world, who will rule with him as kings and priests and who inherit everlasting life upon their resurrection. That doesn't fit with JW theology because their other sheep are still sinners and so do not inherit the kingdom nor everlasting life. Now we come to the moment we've all been waiting for, the big change in JW last day's judgment theology. Once the great tribulation starts, so we saw there in the chart with the destruction of Babylon the Great, so once it starts, is there a door of opportunity for non-believers to actually join us in serving Jehovah? Is there a door of opportunity? What have we said in the past? We've said, no, there will not be an opportunity for people to join us at that time. I never thought that Jehovah's Witnesses could make the change that they are about to make. The reason is that it would undermine their hold on the flock. Consider what he says next. Now, while we're talking about this, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. What do we mean? Well, you know, some of us in the past, we're not going to mention names, <laughs> but you know, some of us have said, oh, you know, my, my unbelieving relative, or, uh, you know, I hope he dies before the Great Tribulation. Aha, uh -huh, we know what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He said, because if he dies before the Great Tribulation, he'll have a chance of a resurrection. But during... Mm -mm. <laughs> Jeffrey's elephant in the room is what you might call a JW sacred cow, which is a doctrinal belief so pivotal to their belief system that it cannot be killed. And yet, here they are about to kill it. To be clear, I'm talking about the belief that once the end starts, there will no longer be any chance to repent. It's like the door of Noah's Ark being shut by God. It'll be too late. Why is this doctrine so important? Why is it like a sacred cow for witnesses? Well, the reason it is so critical is revealed by Jeffers' jocular reference to the common belief among JWs that if you are not a believer, it is better to die before the end because then you'll be resurrected and have a chance to repent after seeing the evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses were right all along. If the logic isn't clear yet, bear with me. For my entire lifetime in the organization, I was taught that any Jehovah's Witnesses who survive Armageddon, quoting from the Watchtower again, will gradually be helped 
to overcome their sinful tendencies until finally they reach perfection, which would be at the end of the thousand years. That is the reward for remaining loyal to the teachings of the governing body. Now, if one of Jehovah's Witnesses dies before Armageddon, he'll get a resurrection and he'll gradually be helped to overcome his sinful tendencies until finally he reaches perfection. What if you are not one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you die before Armageddon? I was taught that you'll still be resurrected and you'll gradually be helped to overcome your sinful tendencies until finally you reach perfection. So, everyone who dies before Armageddon, whether they are a faithful Jehovah's Witness or not, everyone gets the same resurrection. They're resurrected still as a sinner and are gradually helped to overcome their sinful tendencies until finally they reach perfection. However, however, if Armageddon comes first, that is not the case. If Armageddon comes before you die, then if you're a faithful Jehovah's Witness, you survive, and in the new world, you will, again we say, gradually be helped to overcome your sinful tendencies until you finally reach perfection. But, but if you are not a faithful Jehovah's Witness, if, for instance, you are a disfellowshipped Jehovah's Witness, then when Armageddon comes, it's lights out for you. Eternal destruction. No chance to repent. It's too late. So sad. Too bad. But you had your chance and you blew it. Now do you see why any belief that allows for people to repent and be saved during the witnesses' version of the time of the end is critical? You see, if you die before Armageddon, there is really no advantage to being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You get exactly the same reward whether you're a believer or an atheist. The only reason to labor all your life, putting in hours of door-to-door -door field service, attending five meetings a week, and obeying all the restrictions imposed by the governing body is so that you can survive Armageddon, which was always just around the corner. Maybe you pioneered. Maybe you decided not to have children or not to go for higher education and a rewarding career. But it was all worth it because you were ensuring your survival should Armageddon come like a thief in the night. Now the governing body is taking that incentive away. Why labor for them? Why go out in service every weekend? Why attend countless boring, repetitive meetings and assemblies? All you need is to be ready to jump back on board the good ship JW.org after Babylon is attacked. That attack will provide the proof that Jehovah's Witnesses were right all along. Sure, boys, get out there and enjoy life. You can always change at the last minute. I'm not going to speculate as to why they are making this change. Time will tell what effect it will have. But at the start of this video, I said that what they're selling in this talk is truly life-threatening. How so? Many Jehovah's Witnesses have family members who have left the organization. Some have simply drifted away. Others have formerly resigned and many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, have been disfellowshipped. Now the governing body is holding out a false hope. They say that these ones will still have the opportunity to be saved. Once the attack on Babylon the Great is over, once all false religion is destroyed, then these people will see that Jehovah's Witnesses were right after all, since the organization will be, as the saying goes, the last man standing. The point Jeffrey Jackson is making is essentially that given such incontrovertible proof of God's blessing that he has saved the organization while all other religions are now toast, many will repent and return to the fold so that they can be saved through Armageddon. That's the story. But you see, there is a flaw in their reasoning, a very big flaw. It all depends on their being right about not being part of Babylon the Great. But even by their own criteria, how can that be? They claim that Babylon the Great is the world empire of false religion. I repeat, false religion. What makes a religion false by the organization's own rules? Teaching false doctrines. Well, if you've been following this channel, particularly the playlist titled Identifying True Worship, examining Jehovah's Witnesses using their own criteria, I'll put a link to it at the end of this video if you haven't seen it, 
you'll know that all the doctrines unique to Jehovah's Witnesses are unscriptural. I'm not talking about their denial of the Trinity and hell and the immortal soul. Those doctrines are not unique to JWs. I'm talking about doctrines that deny Jehovah's Witnesses the true salvation hope offered by Jesus Christ, the true good news of the kingdom. I'm talking about the very false doctrine of a secondary class of Christian that is denied the adoption as God's children offered to all who put faith in Jesus' name. However, to all who did receive him, he gave authority to become God's children because they were exercising faith in his name, and they were born not from blood or from a fleshly will or from man's will, but from God, John 1, 12 and 13. This offer is not limited to just 144,000 people. That's just an invention of J.F. Rutherford, which has been maintained down to the present, resulting in the spectacle of millions of Christians gathering once a year to turn down the offer of partaking of the bread and wine representing the life-saving body and blood of our Lord. They are willfully denying themselves salvation based on what Jesus says here. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. John 6, 53-56 NLT Jehovah's Witnesses have been preaching a false good news, claiming that salvation depends on supporting the men of the governing body, not on partaking of the life-saving blood of our Lord, which means we accept him as our mediator of the new covenant. From the Watchtower, the other sheep should never forget that their salvation depends on their active support of Christ's anointed brother still on earth. 2012 Watchtower, March 15th, page 20, paragraph 2. According to the Apostle Paul, preaching a false good news leads to being cursed by God. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from the one who called you with Christ's undeserved kindness to another sort of good news. Not that there is another good news, but there are certain ones who are causing you trouble and wanting to distort the good news about the Christ. However, even if we, or an angel out of heaven, were to declare to you as good news something beyond the good news we declare to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I now say again, whoever is declaring to you as good news something beyond what you accepted, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6-9 So, in conclusion, we now come to the reason why I think this new teaching is truly life-threatening. Loyal Jehovah's Witnesses will stay within the organization when Babylon the Great is attacked. They will stay faithful to the governing body, thinking that by doing this they will set a good example for their unbelieving relatives or their disfellowshipped children. They'll stick by the organization in the hope of winning their lost loved ones back to the truth. But it isn't the truth. It is just another false religion that puts obedience to men above obedience to God. So these faithful Jehovah's Witnesses will not heed the warning of Revelation 18.4 to get out of her so as not to share with her in her sins and so as not to receive part of her plagues. By the time they realize that their loyalty has been misplaced, it will be too late. I don't know what else to say. It is like watching a train speed toward a bridge that you can see has collapsed, but you have no way of stopping the train. All you can do is watch in horror. But perhaps someone will heed the warning. Perhaps some will wake up and jump off that train. One can only hope and pray that will be the case. Thank you for watching and thank you for continuing to support our work.